any vision you have is something God is showing you is possible for you. He wouldn't give you that vision if it wasn't a possibility. You, you just wouldn't be able to have that vision. But my advice is this, whatever that vision is, how could you do the essence of that vision today? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Moeller Real Estate and Business Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Moeller, and on this podcast, we will be interviewing guests that have made their mark in real estate, in business, and in other areas of life. Listening to podcasts myself has helped me in so many different ways and continues to do so. If you're a real estate investor or an entrepreneur or aspiring to be either, or just someone that wants to learn, you've come to the right place. An easy way to have an impact is to share this episode with friends or family, provide a review, or just spread the word. We greatly appreciate it. And now let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mobile Real Estate and Business Podcast. Very excited for this week's guest, Matt O'Neill. Matt, how are you doing today? What up, Phil? My man. You guys are going to love Matt's energy today. I met Matt um, a few months ago. He just amazing dude, amazing husband, father of four. We talked a lot about that, um, but extremely successful business person. Uh, re he, their real estate business at one point had 100 employees, 10 million revenue. He's actually scaling back, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is, I'm sure. But Matt O'Neill Real Estate is his business. And then really his passion, what he's super excited about is Matt is the good mood dude, uh, good mood revolution, both podcast and book. And we'll get into that and, and give Matt an opportunity at the end of the show too, to make sure um, you guys can get access to that. So Matt, why don't we start with how did we get here? I mean, how did this all start? And you know, what what are some key stories or things that guided you to where you are today? Yeah, the biggest thing was I wanted to be successful from a young age. And uh, and I don't know what that drive was. I, I've got a, a pretty good idea about it now, but I just had this year, this burning desire. When I was five, I'm like, I'm going to I'm going to run a big company. Just knew I wanted to be a leader of a big company. And, uh, and then I got out of college and I was pretty cocky and no one would hire me because I was really arrogant and cocky and thought I should run a big company when I didn't know anything. Uh, so the only path for me to run a big company was to start one. And so when I was 25, I got my real estate license and started a, a real estate team. And, um, over the last 18 years have grown it now to, you know, at this point we're at 75 employees. Uh, we did scale back from a hundred. Um, but you know, it, it's been a lot, it's been a really fun journey recognizing that I could set goals and achieve them. And that anyone, if you're listening to this episode, you can set goals and achieve them. Every single person has the exact same power to manifest the life that they want. And it's not unique or special to me or to Phil or anyone else who comes on the show. Well, why don't we talk a little bit about that? So you, you built this company to a hundred employees, um, you know, to be able to do that, there's a lot of things that can create that. So how did you build that? And then I think a after we talk about that, let's talk about when you reflect back on that, what that means to you today, but how did you build it first? Yeah, it all starts with vision. And when I was, when I was 25 and I was getting into real estate, Someone gave me a book. It was called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I read that book and it was a mind opening experience. Up until that point, I kind of felt like life happened to me and, and that I would make the best out of whatever happened to me. In that book, I, re I realized the truth, which was everything in my life was there because of my thinking. And that if I wanted a different life, all I had to do was have upgrade my thinking. And he talks in that book about the power of your peer group proximity. He called it your mastermind. And the people that you spend your time with influence your thinking more than anything else. And at the time, I was spending time with a bunch of people who love to drink and party because I love to drink and party. And mm -hmm. I was really good at it, like super good at drinking and partying. And, uh, but my ambitions were to be super good in business. And, um, so 
I started to analyze the people I was hanging around and said, all right, some of these people I can't hang around as much. And so I limited my associations with people that didn't fit the vision of where I wanted to go. And that opened up space to find people that did fit the vision of where I wanted my life to go. And, um, and that was kind of the, the start of, of it. Because here's the thing, Phil, you know this. There's no secrets in the world. Like the path of success has been already paved by countless others. All we have to do is find them and copy them. Yep. So I want to I want to talk about you said limit associates, tough decisions. I, I wrote down tough decisions, limiting associations. Um, how important is that? I mean, I you know I've we've talked about that on the podcast a little bit before, but I don't know if we really dug into like. Did, was that difficult for you? Was it like tough discussions? What, how did you go about doing that? Because I think we all need to do that in different areas of our life, right? So I think it's important mm -hmm. to spend a minute or two on it. Super important. It's the most impactful influence in our lives is who we're spending time with. There was a study done when we used to harm animals to figure out things about human psychology. And they would uh, they they put these monkeys in a cage that had an electrified floor, and at any moment the ex experimenter could push a button and elect electrocute these monkeys by their feet, and they all would just get shocked. And uh, so what they did is they put a ladder in the middle of this room, and at the top of the ladder was a huge bunch of bananas, and they were starving the monkeys. Any time a monkey got on the ladder everyone else would get shocked. That was the experiment. Well, what would happen is uh, they'd bring a new, every, all the monkeys knew, do not get on that ladder. You're not getting those bananas. We're all going to get shocked. So if any monkey got on the ladder, they'd pull them off and then beat the crap out of them. Oh my goodness. Well, eventually they, they would pull out the old monkeys and bring in new ones. And every time the new one came in, he'd get on the ladder and they'd beat the crap out of them. Well, finally, the experimenters stopped shocking the monkeys when somebody touched the ladder. And eventually, they pulled all the monkeys that had ever been shocked out of the room. But the monkeys still continued to pull somebody who touched the ladder off and beat the crap out of them. And, it, and they didn't even know why they were doing it. It was just because it had always been done that way. Well, we have the same tendencies within us. So if there are people that are in our circle that act in a certain way, we will mimic that behavior every single time because we have to. It's the way we have evolved. It's how we get along in the world. We have mirror neurons in our brains. And so if someone around you cusses all the time, you're far more likely to cuss. At the time, I was hanging out with people that cheated on their significant others. If I didn't get out of that crowd, I was in probably in line to get a divorce one day. I was in, I was hanging in crowds where people were doing drugs. I was doing drugs. If I continued down that path, things would have been up way different than they are now. So I said, okay, I, I evaluated every single person in my immediate influence on a scale of one to 10 on seven different areas. I gave them a, a score of one to 10 on health, on finances, on relationships, on their significant other, and on their contribution and charity. And um, and I just rate and, and I, I said, okay, well, this is where I, and I, I averaged it all out. And I ended up being, you know, the average ended up being like five, six, seven in every category. And I'm like, okay, so right now I'm a five, six, seven kind of guy yep. because we are the average of the people we hang around. Yep. And so I said, all I got to do is find nines and tens in these categories. And I didn't know how to do it. You know, I was 25. I was a partier. I wasn't a big successful guy in my in my head. I wanted to be. So um, I said, man, I got to find where do these people hang out? And I, I was scratching my head. I'm like, where do these people hang out? Like, how do you just go find amazing right. nines yeah. and tens and business and, and great family people and great dads and great husbands? Like, where do you find these people? And uh, I started to read a lot of books. And in one of my books, it said, you can pay to join groups of great people. And so the first group I joined was a group called Vistage, which was a business uh, CEO network. And that network was 20 people. And they were in my town. And every 
couple of weeks, I'd go hang out with these 20 people that all owned businesses, all had spouses and kids. And like, these were people who were really taking their life seriously. And that was like the start of my new friend group. Awesome. Well, um, first of all, I heard just, uh, I'm listening to the energy bus by John Gordon, which I hadn't listened to before, but just so important. But one thing he, he, in there, he talks about just like from a business perspective, eliminating people that are sucking energy away from you. And I think if you think about are people giving you energy around faith or finance or family relationships, like all the different categories you talked about, sorry, I didn't say the same ones, but you know, are they giving you energy towards what you want to be doing or, or taking it away? Um, so I think that's really good. The other thing is my guess is you, you graded yourself as a five to seven, but if you went back with what you know and who you're surrounding yourself with now, I wonder if you wouldn't have really, if you grade yourself now, would you say, man, I was really a three or four relative to your, your expectation today because of who you hang around with. And I think it's, my point is you're hanging around with people that are that you're the average of so it's hard to understand and see the like just the difference in people until you start to hang out with people that are taking your marriage or your health or whatever really really seriously so you might Absolutely. give yourself a seven yeah. or eight at the time you're not really earning it at the time i thought that these were five sixes and sevens but with who i hang around with now these were like ones twos and threes for sure but I didn't have I didn't have the relative I didn't have the contrast of who was really exceptional because I didn't have that network. So you so let's go back. So your your focus on building real estate um, your or your business was just surrounding yourself with people. That was the number one thing. Where did so age twenty five? This is when this started. Where did we go from there? Yeah. So then it was setting goals. And so if you're listening to this episode and you are not putting your goals in writing. That's the first step. And it's not incredibly difficult. I, I was listening to um, everything I could get my hands on. I, I would put CDs on in my car because we didn't have, you know, Apple things like that. You'd use CDs. And so I had that visor thing where all the CDs were yeah. on the visor of my car and I'd pull out different CDs. It's sad and that I, some people don't know what that is. <laughs> I'd, I'd turn my car into a university because yeah. I was a real estate agent. And I, you know, I had to drive to all these appointments. I just decided I would make better use of my time in the car and learn and grow myself. And so I listened to a lot of Tony Robbins stuff at the time. And Tony had a goal setting exercise. And he said, all right, of these major categories, you know, the five F's, the faith, the family, the fitness, the finances, um, take two minutes per category and write as fast as you can anything you want in faith. Like, what does your life look like? As big as you can think, don't hold back. Don't use, don't let your practicality get in the way. Any goal you write, anything you can think of has relevance. And so I would write as fast as I could for two minutes in each category. And so, well, if there's only five to seven categories, we're talking like 15 minutes. It takes 15 minutes to set right. goals. And so I, that was the first time I really set goals. I wrote for two minutes in each of these seven categories as fast as I could, set a timer. And then when the category was done, he said, all right, you only get to pick two goals out of each category. And so which, which one or two things in this family category, if you were to achieve them in the next three to five years, would make the whole category a win. And for me, I was like, man, finding the wife, you know, finding, finding my partner in life, that would be number one. And then having children. So these were my two family goals that I said, if I could, if I could do these two things, family would be a total win. And then in fitness, it was like, man, I want to run a marathon. You know, if I could do that, then I'd be in, you know, I'd be really happy with my fitness. And then in finances, I said, man, you know, I really want to make 500,000 a year. And it, it felt scary, right? How could I make $500,000 a year? But I, so I ended up distilling all these goals into just like seven to 10 goals. Just what are the one or two that if I just did this, the whole category is a win. And then the next step, is to make them every single day part of your subconscious and you do that with repetition. And so I laminated these goals and I put them in my shower. And so every day I was in my shower, I was speaking out loud these goals that I, uh, I earned $500,000 every year. And I would just say it as if it had already happened. 
and because this is the, this is how it works is that you speak what has not happened yet as if it's already happened until you you say it so many days in a row that you actually believe that it's inevitable like it's just there's no other way other than that and this this opens up the reticulator uh, reticular activating system yeah. Where you're like, okay, at the time I was making like a hundred grand a year. And I'm like, well, I need to make five X what I'm making. How? I don't know how, but every single day I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. This is happening. This is happening. This is happening. Well, then I'd get a business tip from one of the books I'm listening to. And it would say, well, to do that, all you need to do is just grow your business 500%. It, that would have sounded crazy to me, but because the goal was about to be an inevitability, I said, well, yeah, all I have to do is just grow my business in equal proportion to my goal. So I just need five times as many people to make five times as much money. And I'm like, well, that kind of seems simple. I just need to hire people and then get a bigger office space. And, you know, that doesn't seem that difficult. All of a sudden, what would have been impossible because I wouldn't have believed it was possible was just like kind of simple. And I yeah. just hired more people. Well, how do you hire more people? You just put ads up and you interview them and you bring them on. And then that creates all kinds of problems. <laughs> so yeah. you got five times more people to deal with. And, you know, and then there's like imposter syndrome. I was like hiring people that were three times my age and leading them. And I didn't feel like I had the ability to lead them. And I probably didn't. But this is this is how this is how it works. This is why the this is why any goal can become inevitable if you just repeat it enough times. Well, I think I mean just in the first twenty minutes, I mean we've covered a ton of ground. Just clarifying your vision, right? Getting clear on that association with others, educate. You talked about university on wheels, um, and then goals turn into action, right? And I think as you set your vision and your plan and what you want in those different buckets, associate with others, educate set the goals. If, if you don't know what actions to take, set the goals, take action, it'll guide you to the right action, right? The first action may not be right, but as you start to take action and you get clarity, plus you're, you're supplementing that with other people that have done it, education that's telling you how to do it, you're going to get closer to the right action. You're not going to get it perfect for you, but if you start, you're going to, it's going to guide you to the right actions to build this business. So um, really good summary there, or just a good 20 minutes from you. So business kind of takes off, it's going well, you know, what, what are some key moments or just shifts over the course of time from when, from then to now? Yeah. So we, you and I were talking about it before we jumped on here that I just got back from a weekend with Eckhart Tolle. And there's a, there's a list of the most influential spiritual people in the world that comes out every year. It's called the Watkins 100. And number one and number two are always the Pope and the Dalai Lama. And number three is usually Eckhart Tolle. He's the third most influential spiritual person alive. Right now, he's number four. Uh, this year, Oprah jumped him. Oprah is the number three most influential spiritual person. But I, I had an opportunity to go spend four days learning from one of the greatest spiritual people on the planet. And uh, Eckhart described the same kind of thing I just described to you. Uh, when he was 17, he was given six books. They were written in German in the early 1900s. And those six books said, your thoughts are manifesting everything in your life. And at that point, he didn't have a life he wanted. And so he said, well, if my thoughts are manifesting in everything in my life, I should just change my thoughts into what I want. And so from the time Eckert was 17 until he was 29, over those 12 years, he manifested the job he wanted. He moved into the home he wanted. He changed countries. He learned different languages. He basically just created himself into this person that, that could do anything he wanted to do by changing his thoughts. Well, I was doing the same thing. Just my journey started when I was 25 with the book Think and Grow Rich. But 10 years later, when I was 35, I had manifested this giant company with all these people because that's what I thought I wanted. And at that point, I had three children and a beautiful wife. And I love my children and I love my wife and I love these people I work with, but man, it was so much responsibility and there was so much pressure. And there was, I had built such a big life. I hadn't anticipated how difficult it was going to be. Like life was a lot simpler when I was 25 and I was just taking care of myself. Right. 
And uh, what happens when you build this really big life and you didn't think about the downsides of the choices is that um, sometimes you can have what, you know, people call it a midlife crisis. Well, Eckert had a, a real crisis. He had a complete mental breakdown, ended up spending two years living on a park bench. He was a homeless guy living on a park wow. bench, but his wow. mind literally just cracked from the pressure of what he was creating. For me, it manifested as severe back pain, like just massive back pain to the point I thought I needed surgery. I was seeing chiropractors and acupuncturists and, uh, and then it every I kind of had what Eckert called awakening number two or the second stage of awakening. And that is recognizing that, yes, we can manifest everything in the external world, but happiness, our joy doesn't come from that. It comes from our connection with God, from our connection with actually being in the present moment, which is where God exists. And that, you know, connection to the now is what Eckert says, but he tells a really beautiful story, uh, or he told a really beautiful story at this retreat um, that I hadn't really keyed in on from the Bible. And it was a time Jesus visited two sisters, Martha and Mary. Bill, are you familiar with that story? Yeah, I think so. He, uh, he visits these two sisters and Martha, she's, she's, really excited Jesus is coming to her home. So she's very busy. You know, Eckerd's like, he, he pictures her like cleaning everything up and getting everything ready for Jesus to enter her home. And she's like making snacks and a charcuterie board and lunch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible doesn't go into all of that detail, right? But Eckerd's like, that's kind of what I picture that she's doing. Mary, meanwhile, Jesus walks in the home and she just sits at his feet and she's just basking in the glory of God. And she's at one with God. And Martha looks at Jesus and she's like, Jesus, aren't you going to tell Mary to get up and help me? And Jesus said, Martha, your mind is so concerned with many things. Do not admonish your sister for doing the only thing that matters. Man. And Eckert said, this story is not about two sisters. He says, it's about the two parts within you. We've got this part of us, the ego, that's concerned with many things. It, it like has to keep us alive. It's afraid that we're going to lose our money and we're going to lose our job and things are going to go wrong. It has to like groom ourselves and get lunch ready and take care of the kids, right? It's just concerned with all of this doing. And then there's this other part of us, our eternal soul that just yearns to have connection with our creator. And that's where all of this creativity, innovation, joy, enthusiasm, all that comes from this other part of us, the Mary within us. And we could just sit around all day meditating and just being blissful, but we're also human and we need to eat and we've got, ch I have children and you have children. And, you know, now I have this company that I created and people re rely on me. So he said, the goal now, the second stage is to blend the doing, the Martha with the being so that you're bringing presence and God into your actions. And this is a lifetime pursuit. So, you, so, um, first I appreciate that story, by the way, you mentioned it. I don't, so I'm, I'm not claiming to be an expert on the Bible or at all. Like I'm working on it. We're watching the chosen though. And I'm wondering if they love was, the chosen, it, they're just coming out too. like those episodes. Honestly, it's, it's been really cool for us. Um, because like, my wife and then my oldest is 13 we watch it together and we discuss it so if 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 you're um you know christian i think it's a great great thing to just watch and learn so much about faith and history and jesus uh it's been really really helpful for us so i'd encourage it's you been to watch amazing it. that and I, I even if you're not christian everyone can appreciate jesus like yeah this this right. is he he is he's my favorite guy and, and this show has made him so like the the actor they found he, he is so loving his like he is now when i think of jesus i think of that guy's yep. face yeah yes i mean he's he's an he's an amazing portrayal of jesus and then it's fun watching a little quarrels between the other disciples and like all of their little it's amazing to put like it's you just, I think you can connect the dots on like who Matthew was or who Simon totally. Peter, like you can get it. So then if you're in church or wherever, like, oh, you can connect the dots. Like every once in a while I'll be in church. My, my daughter will look at me like, oh, like 
that makes sense now. Like, or the story, it just, it, it builds upon itself. So I, I, it's been really helpful for us. So I, anyway, um, I appreciate that story. So you're fresh off this retreat. Um, yeah. but I, so I don't, are you like, where are you at with this or what are you working on? Like, how does this, how does this change what you do on a regular basis? Yeah. So today, uh, my wife and I both felt overwhelmed and the, and you know, we, I, we were both sitting here today in this room having a conversation and I, and Eckert said, anytime you feel stressed, you're, you're too caught up in the doing. And all that it takes to unstress is to connect with being, being present, taking deep breaths. For me, putting my hand on my heart, saying a prayer, and recognizing that not everything that we think needs to be done needs to be done. See, the, the survival aspect of us, the ego, says, if you don't do this, you could die. No, that's not really what it says, but it's basically saying that like, you have to call this person back. You have to check this social media. You have to check your email. If you don't do all these things, everything could go wrong. You could miss something. You could miss a huge opportunity. You could, you could have really, really bad consequences. So do it all. And then that creates a tremendous amount of stress and pressure when you're, when you're living a big life that you feel like you have to do it all. But the reality is you don't have to do it all. So I deleted all my social accounts three months ago. I have I hired somebody in the Philippines, awesome guy. He's checking them all. I've got my podcast production company. They're posting different snippets from my podcast and videos and things like that and quotes. And, I, and I'll have direction on what I want them to post. But I'm not, I'm just, I will no longer just be engrossed in my phone and caught up in more of these, like what I, I would say is pulling me from presence. And, uh, and today I miss somebody that, that was trying to refer a client to our firm because the guy that I hired just missed it. And I, and I'm like, I wouldn't have missed that, but what did I really miss? It's kind of like I said, we went from hundred employees down to 75 employees. Is it worse or is it better? I'm trying, my goal now is like, okay, how can I be doing what I'm doing well, being really joyful at the same time? Did he talk about, so first of all, Eckhart Tolle, I was telling Matt on the pre-show a little bit when he brought it up that he was there. I was, I read his book, The Power of Now. Um, I actually listened to like a five minute snippet where he was, it's interesting, you mentioned Oprah because Oprah interviewed him and I, there's like a five minute video clip that I remember listening to like every three months for a while. And I, and I, I need to go find it now because it's just really, really good. But his book power of now, and I would say it's, it's deep, but I remember being reading it on a flight to Europe, being extremely tired when we got there because of the, just the time change and all that stuff and being so present and engaged because I had just read that book. Um, even though I was tired, it just wasn't impacting me. And I was in a, in a great mood the whole time. It just energetic present. So, um, it just, that book, that book has been really impactful for me too. So I'd encourage people to check it out. Um, but I, I was going to ask you, so stage one and stage two, he talks about it and people right now might be thinking that they want to sprint into stage one. Maybe they're in the middle of stage one. You can't skip it. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. You what can't is, skip how you can't he, yeah. skip stage one. You can't. There's no way around it. it until until we wake up from the illusion that we're a victim of circumstance. That until we wake up from that illusion that things are happening to us uh and that we're not actually the sole creator. I, and I, that's taking it too far. I'm not this, you know, Eckert was diagnosed with colon cancer 2 years ago. Did this spiritual master who who is like so loving and so kind and so connected with presence, did he manifest colon cancer within himself? Probably not. You know, so there are there are some events that we didn't manifest. But let's just let's just call it 90%. Right. 90% of of our life, all the people that are in it, 90% of the people that are in it, other, you know, we were born into a family. You could say you chose it or not. I, I kind of think we did have a, a say before we came here and who our family was going to be, but there's no way to prove that. So let's just say you can't 
choose your family and you're just giving them, but you can choose your friends. You can choose where you work. So the majority of all the people in our life are there because we chose them unconsciously or consciously. And our exact bank account balance is exactly what we've chosen. We have completely manifested what's in our bank account. The exact amount of money we make every year is what we have manifested. And um, it's like, it's. I think as far as like accidents, and there are just so many different things that these subconscious beliefs that would say, I don't deserve good things. Maybe that's a subconscious belief within us would then have us manifest an accident that would take away something good in our life, like a new car. And we don't think, we think all oh, that accident, that car accident that I got into was something that happened to me. They blindsided me, they T-boned me, but little do we know that our subconscious beliefs were actually putting us in a position to be T-boned because we had a belief that we deserve to be punished for some reason. It could be guilt is in our subconscious. And this is the awakening. That's awakening stage one, is that we're in fact manifesting 90% of every single thing in our life. And if you wanna take control of your life, you just start to recognize where you've got subconscious negative thought patterns, finding them, uprooting them. This takes a lot of work. But anytime you see negativity within yourself, you sit down with a journal and a, and a blank page and a pen, and you start to write about it and figure out what is this belief that's within me because I got to get it out. Otherwise, I'm going to manifest some pretty tough stuff. And it's why people keep having the same lessons over and over again because they haven't fixed the, the thoughts and underlie them. And then you start saying, well, what do I want? Well, I want harmonious, loving relationships, all, all the stuff we said at the beginning of this show. And then you'll manifest all of those things. And that's stage one of awakening. And if, and that's, I'd say that's probably where the majority of the world needs to go right now. And it's something that I'm not, I'm not leaving behind. You know, I'm also reading Dan Sullivan's book right now, make your future bigger than your present. Because, you know, and, and like to say Eckert's not manifesting a big life is crazy too, or Oprah or any, or, yeah. or the Pope or the Dalai Lama, like Eckert is having a conference with all these hundreds of people and to spread his message. So he, the, in fact, the name of his conference was called Conscious Manifestation. So, so you, you don't ever leave behind this ability to create what you want in the external world. You just, stage two is recognizing that that's not ultimately what is going to drive all your happiness. So, so you're not saying someone's building a business, real estate, whatever. You're not saying don't do that. You're not right. saying, you're saying. You have to do you're, it. You're going to do it. And during that, while you're doing that, you'll be likely in stage one for some time. And hopefully mm -hmm. you'll learn, you'll grow, you'll have pain, you'll have setbacks. And I said, hopefully, but honestly, that's how you learn. That yep. will, that will get you to stage two. So don't, and this, and this try is to what, that's exactly what you said, Phil, you nailed it. He said, uh, he said, the purpose of your life is to awaken and that the way you awaken it's not rosy. He said, I've never met anyone who's awakened during a comfortable time. You, your path to awakening is suffering. And so stage one is going to set you up for suffering. And that's really good. Because once you start to suffer, you'll say, well, now what? I manifested the company. I manifested the money. I, I have the family. I'm giving money to charity. I'm doing everything right. Why am I still suffering? Why am I still frustrated? Why am I still anxious? How come I still don't feel as joyful as I thought I was going to feel? And that suffering then says, well, this wasn't the answer. So what it is? And then you search for the answer. Awesome. Man, that's some really good stuff. And I feel like uh, we hit you perfect timing to get into real, some really good deep conversations. <laughs> like coming off of a four-day spiritual retreat, like in the zone, like you're getting the best of it. So I love it. Um I want to talk, I want to, I want to go back to, um, just what you do. And for, first of all, before I do that, actually talk to me a little bit about the good mood revolution, instead of waiting till the end of the show, like, tell me more about what that is and what you're doing there. And then I'll go back to my questions. Yeah. So in COVID, I was noticing that everyone was was struggling with mental health, myself included. And uh, at that time, I, I was I was moving into my stage two of like, hey, you know, what is actually going to create happiness? 
And, um, and I just had this, I just had this thing in me. Like it was, a, you know, I can't explain it as a pull. It's kind of like when I was five and I knew I was going to grow a big company. I always known I was going to write a book and, uh, and I always knew I was going to teach people how to be happier. So I, I started to write a book during COVID, um, about how to feel good. And at the same time, I'm like, well, I want to interview a bunch of people about how to feel good. So I'm going to start a podcast at the exact same time so that I'm growing my understanding of how to feel good from the smartest people on the planet. And it, and it worked. So I started the good mood revolution podcast and I started to talk to the world's foremost experts on positive psychology, how to feel good, how to not feel bad, how to change our moods. And it's just my total passion. It's it's really the only thing I, I care about beyond my family and my relationships. And um, and so that's what the podcast is. If if you're listening and you want to just learn how to feel good, go to Good Mood Revolution uh, on anywhere you find podcasts, and you'll hear interviews with these the world's best experts on positive psychology. And 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 it's not you know there's this fallacy that that you just think happy thoughts and you don't think negative thoughts. And then that's, what's going to do it. It's actually the exact opposite. The, it's the same kind of thing. Eckert said the path to good moods is by diving into anything that hooks us into negative thinking, because anything that hooks us into negative thinking is only looking at one aspect of reality and ignoring all the other aspects of reality. It's like, you can't look at every angle of a diamond simultaneously. So from one side of this situation, it might make us feel bad, but there are other sides of it, other perspectives that, that would make us feel good at the exact same time. And, um, and I know that's a little bit confusing to say, but it's just the way it works. So tell me, so first of all, for the listeners, we were talking beforehand, by the time this episode comes out, you can, you'll be able to pre-order the book. So we'll come back to that at the end and you can help guide us. But like, I want people to get the book, but give me some nuggets. Like what are two or three things in that book that, you know, just, man, these are impactful. Yeah. The first one is what we're talking about right now is that anyone that we notice ourselves judging, that is, uh, that is one of those thoughts that hooks us into negativity. So all judgment, the opposite side of that coin is guilt. So any judgment we have of another is a judgment we have of ourselves. And how do we free ourselves from that? So if I if I look at somebody or I'll I'll there's a I didn't this wasn't a story in the book but it's a story that I think about when I think of judgment. I was coming home from a conference and they lost my bag. And it was late and I hadn't seen my family and it's like 11:30 at night and I'm tired and I'm just I just want to get home and so I'm I'm standing in line to get my bag from the Delta thing at the airport. And this lady steps in front of me and like takes my spot. And I'm like, well, I'll just kind of step around her. <laughs> and she's like, excuse me. And she puts her hand up and I'm sitting there and I, and I'm, and I look at her and I'm like this bitch Right. And I'm like, and then she's got these like fake fingernails and I'm like judging her hand as being fat and looking at, I'm like, she's got these fat bitchy fingers. And I've got this total judgment in my head about this woman. And, and I'm like, okay, well, every judgment is a self judgment and my path to freedom and happiness in this moment is by turning this judgment around to see how I am that way. And I'm like, am I being bitchy right now? Yeah, totally. Right. <laughs> like, does it matter? Right. In the grand the, scheme of things, exactly. does it really matter who goes first in this line? And and, that, and I'm just standing in line and I'm like, and like, and why am I judging your fingers as fat? Like, do I judge my, my, my own body? I'm like, man, I guess I do. You know, I guess I am kind of hard on myself about how fit I am. And if I didn't do enough workouts or if I wasn't like taking care of myself in the right way. And so just as I was judging this lady, instead of being all fixated on how awful she was, I just, every time you judge someone is an opportunity to turn around and say, how am I that thing? Because if you, if you didn't think those things about yourself in some way, 
the only thing you would have for somebody that was acting in an unkind way is compassion. And again, we'll go back to Jesus. If that lady had stepped in front of Jesus, what would Jesus's thoughts be? Yeah. I just love. He would right. just look at he would just look at someone who was obviously suffering, wasn't connected with anyone, wasn't recognizing that she was creating some challenges for other people, stepping in front of line, acting selfish. All that kind of behavior is really narcissistic, ugly behavior from somebody that's feeling bad already. So Jesus would just have compassion for this woman. And he would just send her immense love because he doesn't have any judgments of himself. He wouldn't be like, he wouldn't, he doesn't think he, he's not bitchy, right? right. <laughs> he's loving. Right. So it, when we get to a higher and a higher and a higher state of consciousness, and I'm not Jesus, I never will be, but I strive to be higher states of consciousness and more loving, our judgments become less and less and less. But the way to get there is to find, is to be so diligent about every single judgmental thought that is right. in your mind and saying, how am I what I'm looking at? Right. So I like first seek to understand yourself. If you're judging, if I, if I'm judging people, which I am guilty of for sure, all of us like dig into what that means. And you talk about journaling and reflection earlier, which I think is really important. And we keep hearing that on this podcast from different guests over and over again, the importance of that habit over a lot, lot of others too. And you said it earlier. So, so stop judging and, and not just the way to stop is for we, self reflect. Yeah, we can't. So we're, you, you, we can't just say stop judging. That would right. be like another guilt inducing statement. It's um, it's, you're going to judge, but every time you judge, if you, if you truly want to become a more loving, which means a, a happier person, if you really want more happiness in your life, every single judgment, take, take the time for it. I started with writing, write out what exactly is a judgment and then say, I am that judgment. So that lady's bitchy, I'm bitchy. And then say, how am I bitchy? Well, then you just list it. You know, we're, we're driving and someone cuts us off and that person's a jerk and that person's this and that person's that. Well, how am I all those things? Well, right now, if that person could hear the way I'm talking about them when I don't even know them, right? they would say, I'm a total jerk. Like, how, like I don't know what's going on in their life and I'm just saying all these mean things. That's what a jerk would do. Yeah. Right? And so it's, that's, uh, that's one, it, it's, that is probably the best tip for for taking the negativity out of our life because all, everything is really just self-reflection and self-growth. Uh, another, another story from the Bible we're all familiar with is when Jesus comes upon people that are throwing stones at a woman. And he said, uh, let, let the person without sin be the one to throw the first stone. Right. And what he's saying is there's no reason to judge or condemn anyone. We just need to look at our own self and our own stuff. That's the only thing that we should be worried about. Yeah, that's, that's really good. That's really good. I'm going to work on that. I like that. Uh, and, and just, that's just a, that's just a small teaser for the book. That's really, really good. Again, we'll have to really encourage people to check it out. I want to talk about um, if you step back and reflect on what you do, how does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, every morning. So I, I start my morning with a journal and every morning I write down like the things I want the most for like my biggest goals. So I'm still doing what I said from stage one, like yep. I'll write out the things I want the most. But the first thing I write out every day is I laugh and have fun today and I enjoy what I'm doing. So it's my number one goal. And it's not a, it's not a overarching, there's nowhere to get like, right. it's not like a 10 year goal. It's not a five year goal. It's not a three year goal. It's today I'm choosing today is fun and I'm going to enjoy it. So how does anything make me feel? Hopefully just having fun and enjoying it. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I want to talk about, so, so your success, um, Okay, we could talk about real. I'll let you decide real estate, but the impact you're having a successful podcast, writing a book, uh, your your family. What is your key to what has been your key to success? I don't really think that any creativity or uh, 
I don't think any great ideas come from me. I really think every bit of inspiration comes from God. I think that infinite intelligence, that, that it's like how clear of a channel can I be for it? So my goal every morning is just to clear my mind and then ask for guidance. And then I just, I'm really good at following it. So when I get nudges, I just say, well, I know I'm this, this internal feeling that I have to produce the book or to produce the podcast or to start the company, it didn't come from me. I just need to do it no matter how scared I am or like how I don't know where it's going to go. So I'm just really good at listening and I do it every morning. So I get up at 4.30 in the morning before the kids get up and it's really quiet. And that, that's a time that I can just connect and be quiet and still. And every morning I got that journal and a pad of paper and I'm just listening and I'm reading and some things will jog my mind and then I'll get these thoughts. And then I just take action on whatever comes to me. But it, it really isn't attributed to me, I don't think. You know, one someone else talked about this, but if someone maybe doesn't picture themselves as courageous or taking action, if you if you want more, if you want more courage, maybe maybe we need more faith, right? I mean, I think faith definitely creates courage. Where if you, like the mindset you have, some people for sure would say everything you're doing, you're putting yourself out there, uh, building a bit. Just all that you've done has taken a lot of courage, and Crazy the foundation amounts. and the the foundation of that has been your faith to say, okay, but this really isn't. You go back to perspective. Okay, this really isn't that much courage in the grand scheme of things relative to right 2000 years ago if you think i mean right well think about yourself though like putting this podcast out there i was really scared same i was scared i was scared th that i would first my biggest fear was that no one would care and that it wouldn't you know no one would listen and that that would prove that i didn't have anything brilliant to say and that was like the main fear the fear that i just wasn't good and then there's other fears like, man, I'm going to do this. And what if I say some stupid things or offend some people? And then what if I have haters and I have all these people that like, you know, it's, and it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of courage to put your art out there. And this podcast is art. This is your creation. Um, but yeah, I, I love what you said that I just did it just because I felt guided to do it. And I'm like, anything God's telling me to do, even if I have negative consequences from it, there's probably lessons that God wanted me to learn from those. Yeah. Well, I would encourage our listener. I mean, we all have fears. We all still have fears. I, and I did, I was, I was afraid of putting this out there. It took me a while. I delayed it. I had excuses, whatever it might be. Um, maybe it was lack of faith, worried about what other people would think of it. Would it be successful or not? All these different quote issues or concerns. And I think we all have that. And I still have those, right? So I think it's good to write those down, think about it. And I would just encourage everybody, pick one that you just, you keep coming back to, coming back to thinking about knowing you're going to do someday or you haven't done yet. Pick that item and say, okay, what are the next couple of steps and go do it? I've got a good one on this actually. And I've had, I've had so many people at events come up to me and say, Matt, what you said to me, that thing you said, I've actually, it's actually changed my whole life. Like I took action on what you said. And it's this, we've got this, we usually have these big grand visions. So I had a big grand vision. I was going to give speeches in front of 10,000 people. Like I was, I've pictured myself up on stage talking to tens, tens of thousands of people, like at a, a big audience, you know, and that was my big vision. And I continued to get this vision. Gary Keller said in his book, The One Thing, he said, any vision you have is something God is showing you is possible for you. He wouldn't give you that vision if it wasn't a possibility. You, you just wouldn't be able to have that vision. Um, however, going from talking in front of zero audience to 10,000, you like, how do you pull that off, right? It's just too big of a leap. And so the, my advice is this, whatever that vision is, how could you do the essence of that vision today? So my vision was to speak in front of large audiences. And at the time, I was speaking in front of nobody. And I wanted to talk about happiness and living this great life and being joyful and getting rid of bad moods. But I'm like, how could I do the essence of speaking in front of 10,000 people today? I'm like, well, I've got this company of 100 people. 
I could give talks to 100 people about happiness right now. And so the next week, I just planned a, a team training open to the company about the essence of happiness. And I gave what I what I called um, like mindset with Matt. And so we had mindset with Matt trainings at my company because I was doing the essence of the vision in a way that I could accomplish it that day. And those talks eventually turned into the podcast. And now at this point, you know, we've got like a thousand people a week. It's not 10,000 people, but it's a thousand people. Eventually one day it probably will be 10,000 people a week listening to these talks on happiness and the whole vision will have come true because I just started with what I could do in that moment to, to do the essence of that vision. And as you said, we know, we know if we have the vision and there's, we know it's possible, right? So, um, yeah. and by the way, you're like talking straight to me here. So I just want to say, um, you're a really good, like, there's a reason. So for, for the, for the listeners, Matt's podcast is in the top 2% in the world in all podcasts. So very, very incredible. And you're a great communicator and storyteller. You illustrate your points very, very well. So there's, there's no one, and you have a great message, like you're well-educated on the topic too. So I just want to congratulate on that. Um, you talked about a couple of different books earlier, but what are some, what is like one or two really impactful um, personal development books, business books that, that um, yeah, have, have made a big impact on you? There's so many. And I'm sure we can share all of them the same. I see some really beautiful books up on your shelf behind your, uh, behind you that I've read as well. I, I usually like to think about what's impacted me recently. And recently, I have been really into the writing of Ben Hardy. And it, the 10x is easier than 2x has been, has been the most impactful book for me over the past year. And then I took his um, training course called Rapid Transformation. And that ha that has had the biggest impact on me that, that I've had in goal setting in two decades since I first started goal setting. He, the book Rapid Transformation is coming out this, uh, this fall. But I'll give you the framework because it's phenomenal. I did it actually this morning. He, all, what you do is you, you say in the past decade. What are my five biggest, most significant wins? And so Phil, I'm going to, I'm going to play this with you. Do, you. do you mind if we just go through this process real quick? It depends. Yeah, go ahead. Try it. All right. In the past decade, Phil, what have been the most significant wins, the biggest events in your life? Just, it doesn't have to be five. Just what are some of the biggest things that have happened to you in the past decade that, that you're really proud of? Yeah. So I would start with um, from a faith perspective, I would even say in the last year, the amount of growth um, has accelerated beyond the last decade. So it's grown a ton in the past decade, but just a ton of a ton of faith growth in the last year, not for just me, but my family, which is really important to me. Um, family, I mean, we have five kids, four of them in the past decade. So uh, and, and our marriage Dude, is You've better, created four better. humans in the past no, 10 years. Well, five <laughs> But four in the last ten years, yeah. So I, I would, I would like to. It's a lot my, of work, man. I would like to say my wife did most of the work, uh, Matt. I, but um, from a business perspective, a decade ago, we didn't have any real estate, and I mean, I was in a completely different world than I am today. And if I look back thirteen years ago, twelve years ago, when we had our first kid, my health was, you know, I was probably forty-five pounds more than I am today. I'm in decent shape for an old man. Dude, um, you're, you're ripped. So, so I would just say I can, those. I can see your veins popping out of that shirt yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but I would just say those four, you know, if I just hit each of the buckets, I feel good about those, but that's. Look at, okay. So I think this was just, yeah. Anyway, go this ahead. This is the rapid transformation framework. So that is what you've done in 10 years is phenomenal. You've created four humans that you're now raising and to be these amazing uh, human beings. You've grown your faith exponentially. You've grown, you've started a business that now is thriving and has made you so successful in life. And you, you're 45 pounds lighter. And in like every area of your life is 10 X in 10 years. And he said, okay, so now from that standpoint, what are three things that you can do in the next 10 years? Right. Right. 
So what uh, do I'm I have just, to answer that? I'm, the, I'm no, asking I, you. Oh what man, are three, I don't know. What are three things? What are the big three things that because you are you now see you're capable of creating things out of nothing that turn into massive success. So what are what are three impossible goals? You're going to have to put me invite me on your podcast to do this to me to put me on the spot here. <laughs> you know, I have I have I have three things um that I focus on. I want to I want to have a team that has fun and wins together. Uh we want to we want to do well and and give a lot, which I I want to just say that uh in our discussion I think in February Matt, you're like Matt is giving in like a, a very, very high level donating a ton, not just money, but his time as well and having a great impact. Um, so that's number two. And number three, you know, my mission from a, from a business perspective is inspire and educate others to live their God-given purpose. That's what I talk about. And I have some goals over a 10 year period of what that looks like, but I want to, I want to, I hope to have a small impact or a big impact, whatever it is on a lot of different people. So um, those are the three big items that get me excited from a professional perspective and, uh, you're helping well, me with that. So thank you. You're, now you're, back to you, back to the show, Matt. You're, you're gonna, you're gonna do it. And, and thank you for like participating and like, you know, but I, I wouldn't have asked you if I didn't know that you were already gonna like, just go for it. This process, this rapid transformation process you just did is way more powerful than any goal setting exercise I've ever done because he asked you to think about what you've already done that is just mind blowing to who you were 10 years ago. And once you see how powerful of a creator you've already been, the vision of what you're gonna create next gets bigger because you remember how big you actually have gone. And, uh, and I love it. So we were talking about impactful books no concept has been more impactful than that for me. And, it, and then it gets a little scary. It's like, all right, so this morning I was like, well, what are my three big things? One of them was complete freedom of time. And as I built this real estate career, I was in the office every day. Today, I'm working from home. I've been home all day. And, and that is a new thing for me. This is so... One of my big three things within the next three years is that I have complete freedom over my time. And to me, that will be a, a massive accomplishment. Uh, another one of my big things is that we, we've talked about it, but I want 10,000 people a week listening to the podcast. And that to me would be a, a, the 10x impact that I'm looking to make in the world. And then the third thing I said was that we have... Um, scaled the property management company we started, uh, which is we started this company a year and a half ago. And that is now we've, we, and within the next three years, I want to acquire six firms and be in six different cities with that company making 500,000 a year in profit. That's amazing. And, and I will just say that, yeah, rapid transformation. Thank you for that. But honestly, I think I, we were joking about it for you to get me to share that for, for the listeners and for you to share it, I think hopefully gets them to realize like the power of that. And we so often, right. We've heard this before, but we overestimate often what we can do in the next quarter or year, but we always underestimate what we can do in the next three, five, 10 years. And I think yeah. that, that exercise puts it in great perspective. Ben Hardy, by the way, 10 X is easier than two X the gap in the game. Guys, there's another one that I that slipped in my mind. That is phenomenal. That he wrote he, too. he wrote a book called be your future self now and uh that might have been my favorite of them um but he his first two books were willpower doesn't work and um uh personality isn't permanent but yeah. i think these i think the be your future self now and 10x is easier than 2x and gap in the game those are his three best and yeah and I haven't read the rapid transformation book yet. I've just taken the challenge and it, I think that he, he actually um, is talking about our property management company on stage at his events. And he said that our property management company is going to be in that rapid transformation book. So I've had a chance oh, to like talk with Ben one-on-one -on -one recently 
because we took his, we took that challenge and there were 600 people, 600 people in the challenge. And he said, I, I want you to grow your, whatever you're doing 10 X in the next three months. It sounds crazy, right? How could you grow anything 10 X in three months? You just said the famous axiom, we underestimate what we can do in a, in a decade, but we overestimate what we could do in three months. Ben's like, F that. Like, I want you to overestimate what you can do in three months and do it. And so we uh, we grew our property management company 500% in three months wow. during that challenge, just applying the principles of what he told us to do. And From home. From home, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and, and then everyone submitted their results after the challenge. Yeah. And he was like enamored that we were actually, that we actually listened to what he was saying and pulled it off. And so yeah. I had a, I've had a, some really op good opportunities to talk one-on-one -on -one with him. And that's why we're now focused on acquiring companies because he's like, okay, what you've done is in three months, you've proven that you can grow this little company 500% in a very yeah. short time. He's like, but how could you grow not just 10 X? How could you grow a hundred X in the next three years? And I said, well, to do that, there's only one path and it's acquire companies. He's like, good, become an expert at acquiring companies instead of an expert at getting more property management doors. Yeah. And he said, whatever you optimize for, you'll become great at. And I'm like, huh, okay, that makes sense. So I called up Joe Wexler, yeah. again, that, the network, and Joe helps people acquire companies. And I right. said, Joe, how can I hire you to help me acquire companies? And he said, you know, crazy thing, Matt, I said, I want to help somebody acquire a company before the end of 2024. And I said, well, I'm that guy. And he said, yeah, you are. And so now Joe helped us. We sent out letters to 200 companies. And in this past week, eight of them have reached out and said, I want to sell. Wow. There you this, go. I'm, dude, I know this, we've taught, we've been all over the place, but if you're listening to this episode, this is, is this is all it is. I, in the very beginning, I talked about surrounding yourself with great people like Phil. You're yeah. listening to his podcast, so you are in proximity with Phil. And then when you're around all these great people, you get these great ideas and they're doing things that you can't believe, like you know, investing in all this real estate like you're doing. And then it's like, well, I could do that too. And then you have this idea and you join a challenge and you get all this stuff out of the way and you just like set big goals and they start to come true. And it's just crazy how life works, man. Yeah. This has been so good. I mean, yeah, we, we, we bounced around, but a lot of impact, Matt, I appreciate it. And I, you know, I thought about taking back what I said, my compliments to you when you put me on the spot like that, but I'll, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stick with it. You are, you're awesome. Hey, a great This podcast. is a higher level of accountability. I just threw three goals out there that I have not even come close to accomplishing, right? 10,000 people listening to my podcast. It's a 10 X growth, you know, acquiring six companies. We haven't even acquired one. I've put it out there in the ether. If I'm going to say it in front of all of these people, then it's yep. got to come true. Awesome. I love it. Matt, how can people find out more about you? The best way to plug in is the Good Mood Revolution podcast or go on Amazon and pre-order Good Mood Revolution book that I spent three years, dude, three years personally pouring over, rewriting, rewriting, rewriting because I continue to grow my knowledge. Um, so yeah, Good Mood Revolution book is, uh, in my opinion, really profound. Awesome. Matt, we really appreciate it. You've been very impactful to uh, me making me go on the spot and announce to the world, but I do appreciate it. you were awesome. So many nug nuggets of wisdom. Thank you for coming on. Thanks, bro. For the Mueller Real Estate and Business Podcast, signing off. Thank you for listening to the Mueller Real Estate and Business Podcast. We hope you found today's episode helpful. If you know current or aspiring investors or entrepreneurs or anyone that would benefit from today's episode, we appreciate you sharing it with them or better yet, providing us a five-star review. To learn more about Mueller Real Estate, visit our website at www.mullerre.com. You can also sign up for our newsletter or local events via our website. In closing, I encourage you to be purposeful in all areas of life, educate yourself, network with others that have been successful, take action and lead. Thank you.